it's happy news or bad news, but I couldn't get the homework to uh, create its auto grader. Uh, so the homework is not released. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean the deadline has changed. So uh, I will, I'm going to try to do it right after this class, uh, but you can expect it by like 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and so it will be there as soon as I get out. Uh, project two, I also decided to delay it a little bit because of the challenge that we had last week. Um, and I want to make sure that it's actually working correctly. So expect the project, sorry, did I say project two? I'm going to say project one um, will be released uh, on Tuesday of next week. Um, and so we should expect that to, to bump out a little bit. We're coming up on spring break though. So uh, that tends to mess things up because I don't like to put any, any work to be done kind of over spring break. So uh, it will likely be finished before then. Any questions? All right, there should be a Piazza poll for an, uh, attendance. Let's say today's number is four, so four. Um, you will have a little bit of time to fill in the poll. Uh, one thing I want to talk to you on, though, if you get the bright idea of being not here and then getting a text or something from your friend with what the number is, uh, we will still do in-person attendance sometimes. Uh, so as a result, please don't uh, pass that information on to people who are not physically here. Any other questions? Is the deadline Yeah, I think I think I sum them all up to be midnight, basically, but it should tell you in grade school. Like today at 3 30. So it's oh, is it by 3 30? Yeah. Okay, so it's whatever Grace Coast says. I, I make it all up at the beginning and then I forget. Um, so you do have a 10% penalty on being late for 24 hours or whatever. Yeah, if, if you haven't noticed already, uh, once I like write something down, I basically got it from my brain. So asking me is usually way less efficient than just looking it up. All right, any other questions? Oh, I don't know the other thing I want to show you. Okay, I'm gonna do something a little uglier. I will uh I'm gonna put these in the slide but I didn't get a chance because we uh, I was fighting with uh, the auto oh, grader. Well that was like this is a whole yeah. Okay, so I will put a link to this directly in the slides. Um but if you Google, and it's important that you get these words correct, okay? So data science as all one word, Python, and then modules. So all those, you know, toolboxes that I talked about before, in Python, those are called modules. Um, and so there's a particular module we've been using called the data science module. And what, sometimes it is very useful to look at its actual doc, uh, documentation. But the reason I clarify, so if you say data space science, and Python modules, it'll be like result on six, you know, page six. Okay. So if you, but if you get the spacing right and sort of drop the S and stuff, you'll usually find it in the first page if you Google it. I will also give you a link. Um, but I just wanted to show you this real quick. Um, because this, you're getting to the point where you are doing things in Python that you haven't seen yet, um, either I haven't given a lecture about it yet. It may not even be in the textbook. Um, and so sometimes you have to go kind of look up the answer or you did see it and you've forgotten or you're not hundred percent sure what the exact syntax is. So like I had a, at least one question in office hour, for example, the difference between with column and with columns and the difference between those two. Um, and if they had realized that there was a difference, uh, they would have immediately seen the problem they were having. Um, so, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is the documentation for that component that we're using. So in other words, it's like an instruction manual, man, instruction manual for like your electric drill, right? So you need to know how to like, you know, attach drill bits. This is what you would go and look at. <clears throat> the one thing I'll comment on with this particular set of documentation. Oh, and another thing is um, it's called documentation. I will 99.9% .9 of the time say doc or docs, okay? Uh, but what I mean is documentation. So one of the things about this particular set of documentation is that uh, I, it's very it's very tutorial oriented. 
So almost like it can kind of teach you how to use the thing, but sometimes you just want the answer, right? And you want to just be able to like scan like the difference between with column and with columns. Or another question we got today was um, uh, they wanted to essentially replace a column. Okay, so like you want to look for the word replace and that wasn't the name of the method. So you need to find that, right? So these are great, but they're kind of tutorial oriented. So, but if you look the ones down here at the bottom, this takes you to the actual documentation for that particular tool, right? And so you can see it here, right here, for example, is with column and with columns. And it gives you kind of a brief description of the two differences. So that might be enough 90% of the time. And then sometimes you want something that's a little bit more complete. And so in here, it'll have uh, what are the arguments means in the method, but then also like uh, what it returns. And then usually there'll be a little bit of example code about how to use it. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So now bear in mind, this documentation is very uh, beginner oriented. Okay. The other thing that we're using is a module called You may know the other big one we're using? Uh, NumPy. NumPy. Uh, and it is normally pronounced NumPy. Uh, I don't know how else you would pronounce it, but if there are other ways, I don't know if they are incorrect. Um, so they have, they have redone this uh, documentation since I've been here last. Uh, so Again, they have kind of like a tutorial focus model kind of here, like this beginner guide, or sorry, getting started, and this, oh, sorry. Then this like user guide, um, but I usually use this API reference, which they didn't use to call that. That's why I had trouble finding it. And then, for example, if I wanted to know how to use the average function, then I would go up in the search box up there and just type in average. And usually you'll get type ahead that'll help you complete it if you can type it all. That working? Oh yeah. I think it's like I said, they, they've changed it around, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, so here's NumPy average. Um, this is I would say a little bit more, you know, kind of cryptic, a little bit more straight, long time programmer focused, but it's not bad. And I believe for most of these, they still also have examples, um, some like here in the code, okay, how to use the thing. So just, these are really good resources for when you are 100% sure if you remember what does this thing do and how does it work, okay? Um, and this is kind of jokingly, but seriously, why it's so hard to do any kind of programming without internet access, okay? I almost never, like I, I used to try to code on a plane when I was traveling as a consultant a lot. And I had these grand plans of this thing I was going to build and all this stuff I was going to work on. And then I'd get on the plane and then for whatever reason, the Wi-Fi would be out or it didn't exist on that particular plane. And I was basically stuck for the rest of the trip because I need to look up something because I couldn't remember how to do it. Uh, and, you know, without internet access, I was toast. So Strongly recommend, like the way a lot of programmers work is, um, this is actually one of the reasons I use multiple desktops a lot, is you kind of have your code window on one screen, right? And then on the other one, you have like 16 pieces of documentation open. I have a whole browser set of tabs, right? With Stack Overflow and Google and, you know, everything else that I'm searching for, because I keep looking up one little thing. Then I have to remember to go back and clean all those up, because otherwise I end up with 6 million tabs. Um, which, you know, just as a, if I can find my mouse again. So, you know, just for example, right, that's one of my windows in one of my Firefox profiles at any given time, right? As you can see, it's green. That means it's CU related. I don't know why I chose green, uh, which is different from personal, which is blue. And which is different from presentation, which you're, you usually see, which is what would you call that, like a pink, maybe? Um, I don't know, some color. So, make sense, everybody? Like I said, I'll put direct links in the slides uh, and or Fiatza. We're working on like a resources guide too that we'd like to post, but it's not done yet. Uh, 
All right. So moving on to the actual crux of the content. Um, so this is a little bit on the subject of uh, what I've referenced in the past at Voltrim. Okay. Uh, so, and I happen to pull this from Fox News, or I happen to pull this from Fox News, but you see this elsewhere all the time. So if you look at this graphic um, and you look at the headline, this looks like taxes are really going to go up a lot in 2013, right? Just by the scale of the little bar. Okay. Um, and I know the resolution is complete garbage, so I you know, apologize. But as you can see, that's that's what they're trying to convey, right? So they are sending a message here in this news story. Mind you, don't forget Fox News uh, actually won a lawsuit by saying that all of their content is not news, that it's entertainment. That's how they won a lawsuit. Uh, so, uh, you know, whatever. They are clearly trying to show an opinion, right? Because, and I'm sure you can't read this because, like I said, the resolution is garbage, but that says 35%. That says 39.6%, whatever it is over there. If you look at it with the full y-axis, that has a very different impression, right, than it does with this, where they just slice the top off, okay? So, you know, I, I regularly, I don't know how much I brought it up in this class, right, but there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, okay? That's a famous quote that I want to say Mark Twain, but I could be misquoting. Um, and so they're basically, they are, they are giving a, a feeling based on correct data that they are presenting in such a way that you, you probably come away with an incorrect understanding. That makes sense? Okay. We'll have another example of that later, uh, but going back to distributions. Um, so I also just, as you probably noticed, I changed the uh, format of what, the theme, so it was a little bit more accessible. Uh, if you're ever doing uh, content for a presentation, um, dark color on light color is much more accessible for most people because it's easier to read. Um, and if you ever are doing dark color, and I actually do do this even when I use a dark color slide, um, you should use a larger font with the light color fonts uh, because it's harder to read and so you need something bigger. So I finally fixed the theme. The problem is it's the same slides, so it may not be 100% accurate on where the positioning is and stuff. I try to pick them all, but I may not, so we'll see. Um, so just calling them, calling them out, most of these we've talked about already, uh, but individuals, those whose features are recorded, okay? And a feature is a characteristic, okay? So when we, when we talk about uh, the tables that we've been showing, you know, each of those columns for any given row, that's one of the features, okay? Um, and a variable a feature in an attribute or an attribute um, and a variable has different values. So this is where one of those name collisions comes in. So when we talk about it in kind of the data science or mathematical sense or whatever, this is what a variable means. But then when we talk about it in a programming perspective, it means like the handle or a name for a particular value. Excuse me. They are actually very, very similar. So you can kind of see why the word is used in both places. But they do have technically different, different definitions. And then values can be numerical or categorical. And so uh, when we talk about those, you know, basically the individual cells on our table or our spreadsheet, um, those are the values, and they can be numerical or categorical. Each individual has exactly one value of the variable, okay? Um, at least as far as we're all concerned, okay? It can get more complex than that. Um, but it causes lots of problems. So even if you have something where you want to have more than one value, this is why you'll see things like eye color, for example, not being necessarily just blue, but maybe they'll also have blue dash green, right? So that somebody can have one feature for eye color, the eye color, instead of having, you know, eye color one and eye color two, right? Um, and then, and then distribution for each different value of variable, the frequency of individuals that have that value. And this is really what we care about here, or at this point, what we're talking about. So, does anybody, can anybody translate 
that language to something that makes more sense or give an example of what do we mean by a distribution? Anyone? I'll probably say it's the amount of individuals that attribute to the variable. Or a certain feature, yeah, exactly. So, um, so like how many of the individuals have that particular feature or that particular variable? Um, this is a classic one, right? Like if you think of like grading curves, for example, like how, what's the distribution of students who got a particular grade, right? That's a distribution. All right, um, and so we have a demo for it, um, but I don't think I had it open, so give me one sec. Or longer than that. All right, maybe I'll do the demos later because uh, that is taking a very long time. All right, so we'll come back to that. Um, all right, so one of the things that we didn't really talk about yet, but we're, we're starting to talk about now is kind of the other kinds of, of charts, right? So we had a plot and a scatter that both we use with um, kind of uh, numerical data types, right? So things that have, that are an attribute type of numerical. Um, and we have another kind, which is the categorical. And we want to visualize those things as well. You're probably familiar with bar charts. Uh, I just showed one, for example, that was a bar chart. So a bar chart, actually just go back for a second. So similar. So a bar chart here. So one of the things I want you to notice is, well, both of the columns in the chart, right? So basically the bars, okay, um, are labeled, okay? And they'll often be labeled in the two different kinds of bar charts we're really going to talk about. One is this kind of bar chart, and another one's called a histogram, okay? But they both have bars, right? So... The thing that you want to notice about being able to tell the difference between the two is that there's a big space here. Okay. So that means that it is a bar chart and not a histogram. A histogram, they're always on top of each other. So we'll talk about why or right next to each other. There may be some like line showing you the difference between the two. So it can have labeling at the bottom, but it won't have this big gap. Okay. Or even a small gap. That is one. Um, and but when we're looking at a bar chart, one axis is categorical and one numerical. So I showed you a bar chart, right? Which is what we think of typically with bar charts, where basically the bars are going upwards. In lecture, primarily, somewhat in the homeworks and the labs and stuff. We often use bar charts that look like this. Okay, so they go out to the side. They're no different. It's just a layout thing so that you can like read it better. Um, and usually when I'm trying to fit it on a slide, a vertical bar chart doesn't work as well. So I'll use horizontal bar charts. Okay. But they're essentially, I mean, they are exactly the same. It's just, you know, whether they're kind of like rotated around. But so one axis will be categorical and one numerical. So in the prior one, um, no, we'll talk about some better examples. Okay, so now when we want to look at a distribution, we're going to use something called a histogram. And so the distribution of a variable, um, you know, for example, the studios, which is in the demo you haven't seen yet, um, describes the frequencies of its different values. Um, and the group method counts the number of rows for each value in the column. So almost somewhat independently, we have a histogram, which kind of displays those groupings. But group can kind of be used on its own to say, hey, I want to know what all the ice cream flavors are, or like, you know, how many of each 
chocolate ice cream ice creams do I have, right? So, or let's say how many different flavors do I have and what's the count of each flavor type? So I can use another method called group and I will extra, extra highlight the little magnifying glass on this. For some reason, invariably, whenever we're teaching this class, um, group is the method that people always forget and don't realize exists and is uh, commonly an answer to, or at least a step in many questions. So, you, you know, just make sure you kind of take note of that and make sure you look it up, make sure you understand what it is. Um, and so bar charts can display the distribution of a categorical variable um, and studio, sorry, this is movie studios from the example that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and one bar for each category and the length of the bar is the count of individuals in that category and you can choose the order of the bars. Um, sorry, this is, yeah, okay. See if we made any progress on getting us to see the load. Yeah, I think it's the networks. I should just like run the whole thing off hot sock. It's my favorite one. All right. So, so what is the best graph for categorical variables? All right, so uh, because I didn't show you the examples, this is going to be a little bit harder, um, but, you know, take a stab at it, see what happens. Right, get those answers in. All right, three, two, one. All right, so the correct answer was bar graph. Um, histogram really shows the frequency of the distribution for um, categorical variables, but we're going to show it gets a little bit more complicated than that. And in fact, we're going to show it right in. So sometimes you want to categorize numbers. Okay, can anybody think of an example of why I might want to categorize numbers? Make it easy to find patterns. Yeah, to find patterns, but I guess give me an example of one of those things. Like an age range or something? Age range is a classic one, right? So, you know, you want to know everybody who's like, you know, 10 to 19, and then one that's 20 to, you know, 29, et cetera. Um, and so that way you can have, you can put them kind of in buckets or intuitively bins uh, and uh, kind of go from there. And we can actually count based on the bins instead of the individual units. That way I can make categories out of it. And so now I can treat a number like an age. So that is a numerical attribute, right? But I can treat it like a categorical one by categorizing. And if I really wanted to, right, I can take like the census data, for example, and I can categorize by one thing. It just needs a little bit weird, right? So normally you do groupings. Um, so does how many people here uh, use bin for track camping? 
right? So that that was my first thought when I saw this, despite being you know largely American. Um, but that was my first thought. And then the other thing that uh, I really I had a good clip in here a while back that uh, is I don't know disappeared somewhere along the way. But the other thing I think of is uh, going to airport security. You know those plastic bins and trying to shovel all stuff in. Had a really great old gif of uh, how the fun that could be. So it's referred to as putting things in bins, and the activity of putting things in those bins is called binning. Okay. And so the first thing we do is we have to define what those bins are. Okay. So I just kind of rattled off some, right? 10 to 19, 20 to 29. Um, and typically they are defined by their lower bound, which would be inclusive. Okay. So, and then their upper bound is exclusive. Um, and so, you know, have you noticed the pattern here, right? Like we, we try to use the same mechanism in all scenarios. So the bottom is always inclusive and the top is always exclusive. Okay. So, uh, now we have, uh, what I thought was a fun little game. I will definitely admit it's a stupid little game. Um, but so if we wanted to categorize, uh, this series of numbers, we don't know what they are, doesn't really matter. Um, but here are our bins. Each bin is uh, basically five, right? So where does my 188 go? Do I have an answer? You have it. What is it? The top end, just you can also just tell me the range. Oh, yeah, uh, 185 is canceled. The so 190, yeah. <laughs> so, and then see, it's an awesome build slide. So look at that. Uh, I just like to show off my PowerPoint skills. Um, all right, and then so 170. 170. And that looks right, right? Because it's inclusive, so therefore it's going to go in that bin. All right, 189. Where's that one going to go? All right, come on. All I want to say. All right, you done? All right. Cool. All right. Um, and then, uh, whatever, 163, I think that was easy, right? Because it's kind of right in the middle. And 183. Um, and then what about 171? Where's that going to go? Yeah. And then 185? All right. So we have a couple more. Um, but just to give you the idea, right? So you set the bin sizes, then you kind of put all the things in the bins, um, and now you can do, uh, you can kind of get a distribution out of it. And if you actually look at this picture, this is a histogram, right? It's not drawn quite like a histogram, but you can see, you can actually figure out exactly how many elements are in each bin, right? By the shape and size. Okay, so if you assume that each of my little blocks is the same size, and because I copy pasted, they should be, um, we know that there's one element in this bin, we know there's one in that one, we know there's three in the next one, okay, and then we skip the one and then three. So we can actually look at the size of the bin if we imagine that instead of these nice lines here, okay, so I'm actually, hey, that one's a little bit too far left. Um, but I have these all separated nicely, right? But you can imagine them just being stacked on top of each other and not having separated lines. You can still tell from the height compared to the rest how many are in there, right? So that's an important quality of histograms. All right. So I think everything's loaded. So maybe we can. Oops. Okay, I swear it makes that. Let me make sure this is the right file. Okay, 
I swear I fixed it. All right, is anybody else following along? Does it say lecture eight or lecture seven? Okay. Oh, I fixed it. <laughs> All right, so um, I was still thinking. Okay, uh, so basically, this is just the table. I can't remember if I showed it in the lecture already. I might have, uh, but basically, it's just the table of um, of movies and like how much money they made and what year they came out. Um, and I want to say this is in millions of dollars. I mean, it's in, it's not like, it's uh, it's just normal numbers instead of like millions or something, which would be easier to read. Um, but so that's gross. So that's, you know, how much it made um, and then adjusted probably for expenses. So it's like profit versus um, gross, which, so it should really be called net. Uh, if you ever see net on something, it means that it's heavy expensive to move. <laughs> so but as you can see, um, at least as of this data set. Oh, we had fun things about mouse again today? Okay. Okay, so as you can see, um, you know, we have a bunch of movies. You've probably heard of most of them, maybe even seen some of them. We have the movie studio that produced it, uh, and then how much money it made and what year it came out. <clears throat> so, what we can do is make a bar chart out of it. And like I was saying before, we're going to make a horizontal bar chart primarily because it's a little easier to read. Uh, but if you know, couple things. So the first thing we do is we're actually turning the numbers into in terms of millions, okay, so that uh, we can kind of get some nice sort of scale. Um, and then I'm going to grab, so take and get uh, this number of rows, basically. And so I use NP arrange to in. So that's going to give me zero through nine, right, top rows. Um, and then I'm going to throw them into a bar chart, but you know the standard bar chart is normally vertical. So so dot bar is a vertical bar chart. Dot bar h is a horizontal bar. Chart. Uh, and then I just give it some uh, titles, or I give it the columns I care about. Um, and so we end up with this nice uh, little bar chart, and we can see that Titanic. Seems to have blown most things out of the water. I didn't even know what to do with that. All right. I didn't say it was a good joke. All right. So, uh, but what we're going to kind of look at here is uh, a little bit more about the studios themselves. Uh, and so these are the various movie studios that were involved. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to group them. And we want to know because we want to know, say, how many movies each of these studios produce. Okay. And so what happens when we use the group method, uh, we can say what column we want, right? But then it will insert a column called count. Okay. And it'll just count that thing. And it'll kind of throw out everything else. Uh, so you can do other operations, but you have to tell it. So by default, what it'll do is it'll just count them up and create a column called count and give you the appropriate result. So here we can see that like Fox and Buena Vista has made a lot of movies, um, you know, whereas like, I don't know, IFC, right, which is the independent film channel, I think, or something like that, um, like they've only made one in this list, okay? Uh, I think this is the top domestic grossing films, you know, as of 20, whatever it was, 14. Um, so clearly, IFC needs to make more uh, blockbuster movies. All right. So one of the things I want to do, though, is just to kind of cross-check my work. And 
this is something that's really important. I, you know, I keep saying it's like when you're doing your homeworks, uh, you know, or the labs, or whatever, add cells, right? Like try to figure out is the thing that you're trying to get, are you sure the inputs that you're working with are what you think they are? Because uh, that is a common error. So one of the things I can do here is I can say, let's sum my studio distribution. So I want to point out a couple things here. So, uh, so what we did was we uh, did that grouping. We shoved it into studio distribution, which counts up all of the movies. So first of all, what do you think this result will be? What will the sum be? Or what should it be if there's no bugs? All the numbers in the count column add together. Right, but what's, what's the value going to be? Compared to the actual uh, data table, uh, I think it's higher than this. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. So this is this is why I try to point that out. Um, admitted rows. So you read the 190, which is the part that says rows admitted. Um, there's always 10 above it, so you know that it's 200. Um, but yeah, so 200 is the answer. But another way to think about the answer is it should be the same number of movies that we had uh, in the initial table, right? The grouping shouldn't change how many total movies we have, right? So when I run that, I get a sum of 200, so that looks right. And so the reason I pointed out, right, is just a good way to cross check. Did I group it the way I think I did, right? Um, okay. So now, so now I can create a bar chart, right? Which is going to be really big um, with the total movies that each of these uh, studios has produced. Um, and so that's kind of one of the nice things about doing groupings. Um, let's see, show us. Um, and then more usefully, what do you think would be a more useful or like more interesting? Like what, what do you kind of expect this to look like? You might want to sort it by like number of movies. Right. Can you tell me how to do it? Sort. Sort. Again? Yep. All right, and then we want to go kind of reverse, right? Because we don't want to go smallest number that's largest number. We want to go biggest to smallest, right? Because that's probably the more interesting one. So we say descending equals true. So we're going to think it correctly. All right, and then I want to see the graph again. So what do I do? We know the answers. Okay, right here. Put it up to bar H. Yeah, so pass it bar H again, but I have to tell it what um, column I want to bar H on, right? So I'm going to do studio again. I'm assuming I typed all that correctly, which is a complete toss up. I did not. No. Uh, see it now. All right, and that's kind of what we wanted to find out, right? So, point of this. Uh, Definitely does a good job of making blockbuster movies. So does Warner Brothers and Paramount and Fox. They're actually all pretty close, and then they kind of drop off pretty fast, which I think is kind of interesting. All right, so I think it says to go to the slides now, but we're going to keep going. And so if we want to look at a numerical distribution, so I think this is still going to give us a good result. I don't have uh, my cheat sheet has an old date. So,
Okay, so we went back to our original data set and we said, all right, let's look at the top movies column year, right? Subtract that from 2023. So what's that going to tell me, right? It's going to give me the age of that movie. Um, and so then I can say, okay, now I have all those ages for what, you know, how long ago it was produced. Uh, and then uh, we're going to add that actually to the table itself. And so now I can see kind of from a different perspective. And remember, the sorting wasn't given, so we didn't tell it what to sort by. But we can see Gone with the Wind, right? Very old. Um, most of these are quite old now, like so 48 years for Jaws, which still kind of blows my mind. Um, Titanic, even, which was 26 years ago now, uh, which makes me feel old. Um, but so uh, that's kind of the idea. But now I can kind of say, okay, how old are those movies? Um, and that's treating it as a numerical distribution. But now let's think about how we can treat it as a uh, categorical distribution. So we are going to do in it. And so when we want to figure out the bins for something, we what's the first thing we kind of need to know, given that we don't actually know what the data is, or let's say we don't know what the data is. Any ideas? Any other ideas? Total will be interesting, but there's a, a like, but if we're doing a bin, we want to have like, we're going to have a bin of a particular size. Let's say we, we already have an educated guess. Let's see what I said for a bin size. Um, actually, this one's variable, but call it, let's say the bin size is going to be five ish. Um, so, but how do I know where the bins start and stop? Right? Did I have a bin? Yeah, you have to find the minimum and maximum to know how how much to distribute the bins. Right. So I need a minimum and maximum so that I can make bins that kind of include that, right? Because if I did bins that were, you know, negative 10,000 through, you know, 50,000, we're going to end up with our, like, you know, distribution being this tiny little part in the middle with all these, like, empty bits. So the first thing we often want to look at is, like, what are the min and max? of this um, data set. So we're going to do that with not min GS, whatever that is. And just to show you another quick trick, um, so far, most of you have been uh, displaying something. I use kind of leave it there on the line by itself. If you put a comment in between it, it will kind of print them all. Okay, so you can keep adding commas. Um, and so in this case, I did that with min and max. And so I get one or the, I guess the youngest movie is six years old, right? And the oldest movie is 102 years old. So, but for the sake of making this slightly more interesting from a data perspective, this one. Right. Um, oh, so this is why you have cheat sheets. Um, so I'm going to make the bins slightly arbitrary because what I'm, let's say, I'm interested in is knowing kind of recently. So let's do. Okay, so now I'm going to have uh, all of these different bins, and I'm going to stick them into a variable called my bins. Um, and yeah, and we'll show you kind of what that means in a second. Um, and so now I have that array. If I want to get them into bins, I can now do this handy function called bin. 
which works on an array and Okay, and so a couple things I'll point out here. Uh, so our bin data, we can use that bin function uh, on a, a table, and we can get back, hey, let's allocate these by bins. So this is kind of like the grouping, except specifically with the bins. Excuse me. And what the other thing I wanted to point out was Oh, name parameter. So um, one of the things that we've seen a little bit so far, so descending equals true, for example, or this one where bins equals my bins. So when we have those lists of parameters and we pass to a method, we can actually tell it which value we want this thing to be. And you'll see that in the documentation where um, this parameters here on the bin I can just say, you know what, I want the bins value the variable or the thing in the method to be equal to my bins. And that's what I'm doing here. Okay. And it's one of the weirder things, I think. So if it's not immediately obvious, it's okay. I'll we'll figure it out eventually. Um, but so now I've bid the data. Okay. And so I have um, my ages. Uh, and I've missed at least one movie, probably, because my bin top is too low. So let me go back and fix that. Because if you notice, right, it's six to 102. So let's rethink this to maybe be 105. And let's start at five. Okay, so now all my bins have stuff in them, uh, almost, right? Um, I feel like I should have one in there, but oh no, it's grabbing, it's grabbing it in here. Sorry, I didn't need to do that. I could have left it one. I actually would have dropped it. So um okay, look very short. So now we have all these various bins, and then yeah, and so my cross check, which is gonna be to sum those. So I'm gonna cheat and paste. Okay, so basically that the same thing I did before. I get 200 because they are all accounted for, right? Because I raised it to 105. Um, so but so the easier way would have been just to use NP arrange, um, but we can do something slightly more sophisticated. Wait. This one? All right, I don't know why I have that R prompt. Um, so All right, so this is going to be different bins, but as you can see, right, I can use NT arrange there and I can use something that is kind of a little easier. Um, so a lot of people get nervous when you use bin sizes that are not consistent for kind of the same reasons that we were showing earlier in the slides, is that it, it kind of feels a little bit like you're misrepresenting things when a bin size is one is like way bigger than the others. So it may appear that um, there's, you know, more or less movies in that period of time. So as a result, it's more common practice to try to use bin sizes that are the same without like lots of explanation. Okay, it is often very valuable to never do that, but you want to just make sure it's very clear why you're doing. It. So, um, so yeah, so this just does a new array and attaches it to bins, and it does it from zero to one hundred two, stepping by twenty five. Okay. So, let's go to the histograms. Okay. 
All right, so just as a way of remembering it, um, we should still have the old values in my bins, which we do. So now we can use this convenient function similar to the bar uh, called hist or histogram. Um, and as you can see the differences, like I said, one of the big iconic graphical differences is the gap between the bars is very small, if not at all, okay? Uh, and that indicates to you that it's a histogram. But the reason they do that is because of what I was talking about before, which is that like the, the distribution here, or like the number of elements in each of the buckets, you can calculate it based on the drawing itself, okay? Because I can tell that this has a certain height, right? And so therefore I know how many elements are in that bin. That makes sense? Yeah. And then this number over here, unlike on the bar chart, is going to be a percentage of the elements in all bits. Okay, so how much of it landed in here? Okay, right? Yeah. So, so that's our this is much harder when I get these. So that was using uh, the bins that, for whatever reason, we thought would be interesting. Um, but if we do the same thing, but let's uh, use equally spaced bins um, by bins equals into range. And I'm just going to make this simple by doing. Uh, let's do five to one ten and step by ten. Then okay, and so um, basically we just change the bins, right? But there's the same amount of data in there, all that stuff. The distribution is the same ish. Right? It's just that where it's distributed is slightly different because we've allocated the bins more evenly. Um, and so I specified basically a bin size of 10 in there, right? If you notice, that's what that step is. So that's the bin size. However, we can be even lazier by not specifying a bin at all, but I do have to specify what thing I'm trying to do, look for the distribution of, and that's what unit is. By just not okay. Last of course. All right, and so now. What the system does then is it tries to look at the range and then guess even bins that make sense. Okay. And a lot of the times it's right. Okay. Or, or it does something reasonable. And so in this case, it looks like it did bins maybe a size 10 ish. Okay. Because the numbers on the bottom aren't always the same as the bin size. They're just kind of more like to give you a sense of the scale of it. But those lines tell you the bin size. Right. Um, let me see. So let's say if we wanted to actually figure out how much, like what percentage of uh, movies are, or yeah, what percentage of movies are in each age bin, okay? So let's actually add that to the table because that may be useful as actual hard information, right, versus the picture. So we can say with column, And we can calculate it. Here. 
Okay, so now I can see how many of those. Right, so the age count is how many of, of the movies are literally there, but it's also what's the percentage of the total uh, that actually um, those movies represent. Okay, and so that's kind of what gives you a history. Let's see what. Yeah. Let's go back to the slides for a minute. All right. And so what we call that thing is the area principle. Um, and we're a little out of order, so this could have happened earlier, but the upper bounds of the blank of the next in what is blank. Um, so what were OEO these fits in where the all caps blank is. I can tell you one of the questions is obviously, or one of the answers is obviously one. All right, who's answered it? Run out of time. All right, maybe I should make the five for a who chose one of the answers stand up. All right, so there's the responses. We have four people who chose the last answer. Um, but yeah, so uh, the upper bound is the lower bound of the next kid. Right? Because of the inclusive exclusive. Okay. All right. So, oh, that did not mean for All right. So, that should say, what is wrong with this picture? Uh, this is one of those, the theme changed and it didn't update it correctly. Um, so, what do you think? Any ideas? Same image, but it's magnified. Okay, so that means a little bigger than it's here. It's the same as the previous iPad battery and the new iPad battery are essentially the same, but the new iPad battery is bigger size. Yes, but is it a hundred percent bigger? If we're going off that, that's way more than a hundred percent bigger. Yeah, it's actually more like four hundred percent bigger. Okay, um, because. Even though our kind of eyes look at it and we kind of treat these as um, like it, it kind of just looks bigger, right? Because it's the same graphics blown up, right? But if you actually try to stack this in here, it's it's pretty close to 400 percent bigger. Drawing may not be the best in the world, but you get the idea. If you put this thing in there, right? And you put another one right there, you can put another one up there, and then another one over there, right? So the scale isn't quite right. And so, basically, the area principle here is the area should be proportional to the values they represent. So the question here is, um, which one of these is double the uh, the A? Okay, so is the answer B or C? And the thing is kind of obvious from the graphic, right? That when you're talking about this, that that kind of blowing it up on all dimensions doesn't actually make it double. It actually it will often quadruple it, depending on kind of how you're doing your, your scaling. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind that you've got to make sure that they are remaining accurate. Right, let's see what else we have to finish. All right. So a histogram of the chart that displays the distribution of a numerical value for attribute uses bins. 
there's one bar corresponding to each bin, and it uses the area principle. So the area of each bar is the percent of individuals in the corresponding bin. Okay, and when we say area in this sense, we mean like mathematical area. So if you draw a square, right, and calculate the area of the square or rectangle, I guess, um, that's how many individuals will be there. And don't know if we'll really get to it today. Um, skip this. Yeah, and so the way it ensures this, right, is that a histogram, that, that method, okay, uses a scale that ensures that the area of the chart sums to 100%. So in other words, when, it, when you show, when you see that picture, that picture will be correct if you use this histogram. You got to be a little careful, right, because you might be, I don't know, drawing it by hand, or you want to draw it using some other mechanism. You just got to be careful that you're, because you should be able to rely on the picture being measured, like you pull out a rule or you go know, like calculate exactly how many individuals are in each thing. Um, the horizontal axis is the number, uh, and the bin sizes don't have to be equal to each other, but like I said, it's conventional to do so. And vertical axis is a rate or so, like a percent per year. Okay. And then we'll probably cover these some more again, but. This is kind of how you calculate the height. Okay, so the height of the bar will be, um, you know, trying to explain this. So the, the bin is 65 minus 40, so 25 years wide, and the height of the bar would be 25 and a half percent because you know what percentage it is, and then 25 years. So if you wanted to actually draw your own histogram, right, this is how you calculate what each of the boxes looks like. Okay, um, which obviously in Probably next lecture, maybe the one after that, you can obviously invert that, right? So that you can look at the box and you can measure it and figure out how many there are in each area. Um, does that make sense? Any questions so far? Uh, I still find history I'm super confusing, so feel free to you know find them super confusing. Uh, they are really, really useful though. So um, once you kind of get the hang of how they work, you can kind of glance at something and really get a good sense of like distribution or, or kind of where the allocation is. Uh, so they're super useful. Um, and it's important to recognize the difference between all those different charts and when to use them. Yeah. Any questions? All right. Call it there and see you Tuesday. Uh, like I said, the alert will be out live tomorrow morning. Uh, and then the project one will get released on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay.